Jesus says this in John 13.35. It's a great passage to be reminded of constantly as uh, when we're in public, even when we're meeting with other Christians, as we constantly are praying for ways to uh, tell people about Jesus. Uh, may we remember this passage, but Jesus says this, By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another, it's John 13, 35. We are constantly, as Christians, saying, oh, I, I wish I need more opportunities. I wish I had opportunities. I wish I could speak up. And here's one that's handed to us on a silver platter, is that the watching world can see the love of Christ through how we love one another. And as we look around the room, how do we, as we look around the room, how do we then love one another as God intends, as we are all so different in so many ways. You could look around the room visually and see somebody uh, and recognize that you're different from them. And then there's the whole thing about actually talking to them someday, and you actually realize that they're, everybody's has a lot of differences, but yet we are called to love one another. So with this, how can we get along? How can we all get along, let alone grow closer to each other, which is the next step of this. Oh, we have peace, yeah, just as long as you stay over there. But no, no, how can we then grow closer to one another in love while the whole world's watching? It's one thing to put up with each other. It's another thing to grow closer. And it's another thing for actually other people to recognize this love of all these different people. And as the Bible says, different tribes and tongues would come together, and the world should be amazed, and we should be amazed at what God does. So in this passage we're looking at today, First Thessalonians is the book we're in. Uh, we've been in for quite a while. First Corinthians, I'm sorry, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. And what we're going to see here is that this passage gives five commands that show your responsibilities towards other Christians so that you may live in peace with one another through loving one another. We're going to read 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, and 15. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, and help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Verse 15, see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. And just before this verse, in verse 13, which we finished up on last time, uh, we see that it's a, it's a transition point. Verse 13 says, live in peace with one another. And we see that initially, uh, it's between these two verses, and it's a transition in the sense that in verse 12 and 13, we see that everyone is supposed to be at peace with their leaders. We saw what that looked like last week. But it also means, as we transition into this, being at peace with one another. And this section is filled with what we call imperatives on uh, how Christians are to love one another. Imperatives are commands. That's the verb form. And with this, we see that while this is all to all Christians in the church, these commands are to all Christians in the church. But we know, depending on which day it is or what's going on, the strong ones need to take the lead and in initiative. The strong ones need to recognize it might be a day where you were weak yesterday and you're strong today. This is your day to take the initiative on these things. And so we're going to see these things. And all of this is founded on the love of God first, which then leads to the love of one another. And we see that this foundation of love in the church was initially seen in the first church we see in the book of Acts, the church of Jerusalem, uh, verses 2, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verses 44 to 47 says this about this church. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone had a need. 
day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having pay, favor with all people, even the ones outside. And the Lord, listen to this part. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Just a little hint. That's church growth. The Lord is adding, because everybody's watching what's going on the way the Lord intended it to be loved in the church, and that's the way the truth of the church grew. It was through the truth of people following the word of God and loving one another. That's church growth. In this, we see that even though this was going on, the church in Jerusalem, they loved well in the midst of persecution. They had heavy persecution, way more than we have. What was going on there when the church started 50 days after they watched Jesus, who they raised their hand and says, I'm with him, tortured and crucified. Do you think they had a rough time? Yes. And with this love, they had peace with one another. And the truth is, is they have way more, they had way more persecution back then than we have today. So once again, we're going to see this. We're going to see this in this passage, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14 and 15. We're going to see five commands that show your responsibilities towards other Christians, show that you may live in peace with one another, and uh, it, this will come through loving one another. So he starts out with these five imperatives. Get this part. This is, this is amazing. Paul starts out, I guess the word amazing isn't it. It's very thought-provoking. Paul starts out with five imperatives to deal with five types of problems that people have in the church. This is what he's talking about here. He's going to address five different problems that people are having in the church. And with this, though, see if this sounds familiar, these five problems include problems and or problem people in the church. Not just problems in the church, but it may even be, and you'll see, problem people. Does that sound familiar? And I'll give you a hint. By the time we get through this thing, you'll see that it's not just people within the church. But initially it starts out in the church. And so he starts out in verse 14. He starts out with this. We urge you, brethren, which means he is commanding these things in a strong sense of authority and urgency. He's saying you got to do this. And it has to start yesterday. And the first one we see is, verse 14, admonish the unruly. Admonish the unruly. And admonish means to warn, to stir into action. It's an imperative command. And the word is used in the Bible and in other places in the Greek to describe, a, and even in society today, to describe a soldier who is out of step, going his own way, doing his own thing. He's disorderly, insubordinate, not keeping in rank, and in defiance of good order. Well, that's easy to relate to ourselves. In the church, <clears throat> there are those who are idle or lazy, freeloading, and sponging off of others. They're out of line with both their behavior and their attitude. And Paul addressed this issue even in greater detail in his next letter, 2 Thessalonians. But this is what he says there in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 8. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tra tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined manner. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. This is the example, the tone that Paul is setting. We already knew that he was a tent maker. We knew that he worked hard. And we see as we continue on, uh, these people are often then busybodies who have great ideas on how everybody else should do their jobs but won't lift a finger to help out. We call them uh, here, 
We call them consumers. We call them consumers. And we get this from Proverbs 30, 15, who uses a different word. Uh, but we call them consumers. The leech has two daughters. And the names are give and give. Proverbs 30, 15 pretty much describes what we're talking about. Paul had spoken to them about this also in 2 Thessalonians. And even earlier, uh, the chapter before, verse four, in chapter 4, he says, For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. So he's pretty serious about this. And <laughs> Paul gives these descriptions of these people in 1 Corinthians and uh, 2 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, 2, and basically the list is basically like this. They're the ones that are not exercising their gifts in the church, not, or perhaps they're not tithing or giving to the church, 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 Corinthians 8, or they're not, uh, maybe they're not supporting leadership as we just talked about last week. They may be bitter, angry, contentious, and therefore rebellious. There's all kinds of reasons that they might have this attitude, but we see then in Ephesians 6.14, when you put on the armor of God, they have not girded their loins for the battle. Girding the loins means getting squared away and making sure you're squared away and that you are ready to go out there. And basically, the ones that we're talking about, which Paul goes on to say in 2 Thessalonians 3.14, if anyone does not obey our instructions in this letter, Take special note of that person. Do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. It's, it's like, let him be embarrassed. He should be embarrassed. It, it's amazing that, that he's not embarrassed already, but it's, it's a matter of maybe you need to help it along. It, it says, don't associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Do not regard him as an enemy, though, but admonish him as a brother. And the congregation must deal with them initially one-on-one -on -one is what Matthew 18, 15 tells us to do. It's, a, it's an issue where uh, these things need to be recognized and brought up one-on-one. -on -one. Yet, yet it may lead to an escalation of discipline if his sin is not corrected. Matthew 18, 15 to 20, and we'll see that later on. Admonish the unruly. Here we go. Verse 14, B, the second part of verse 14. Encourage the faint-hearted. Encourage the faint-hearted means to comfort, appease, and cheer up. It's an imperative command. And we know that, as it tells us in a command, to weep with those that weep, uh, we, we, we really shouldn't even need a command for that. We should be able to weep with those that weep and love on them. It, it should even be an imperative. The faint-hearted are those who are discouraged, dejected, and despondent, possibly from a death or some other tragic event that feels like death. Maybe even to them, death would even feel better than this. And we see this word being used. The family of the deceased man, Lazarus, suffered in this way, said here in John eleven nineteen. 19, that many of the Jews had come from Jerusalem to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brother. And those are the ones who were sorrowful, and at this point right now, having a timid spirit. You might have had a bold spirit last week, but, but it, it, that situation is going on right now. And it may be just a temporary condition, which is always something for us to try to reflect on when somebody's in that. Is it just a temporary condition that, hey, don't it's going to get back to the way it was before, but right now you're on the low part. Or, or it could be a lifelong tendency that is constant work for them to overcome. Some people have it, this, this situation, this feeling all the time. Some people, it's only temporary. It's good for us to even see and recognize what they're going through so that we can help them be, depending on the circumstances and the context. And these are the ones that Paul was encouraging, we can see in 1 Thessalonians 14, 13, when he was talking, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, when he was talking about the rapture and the day of the Lord, 
about uh, talking to them that, that hey, don't, don't worry. I know that you're faint-hearted and upset because you think that maybe the rapture already happened and you missed it and now your loved ones missed it or the day of the Lord is already here and, and your loved ones missed it and you're upset about your loved ones. And we see that Paul tells them then and tells us now, therefore, comfort one another. It might be your day tomorrow. These are the ones that suffer from worry, fear, and anxiety. And in some cases, as we know, because the enemy loves to do this, in some cases, even from the persecution as new Christians. They get all excited about coming to the church and getting baptized and saying, here I am, I'm so happy to be here, and what does Satan think of that? Man, he is going to pummel you. And, And so it could be a situation where they look like, what did I sign up for? Well, it wasn't what you signed up for. It's what God signed you up for. And and so these people, we need to recognize what they're going through and encourage them and remind them even, even Philippians 129 that tell, tells us basically that, that not only have we been appointed for salvation, but also for suffering for Christ's sake. These are things that we need to understand and encourage them. And with this, if they're new Christians, if that's the situation they're going through, they may be afraid of the risk involved in being a new Christian all of a sudden, and even evangelizing other people, or even afraid of other steps of growth because they're afraid, they're weak in what they've gone through, and they they just they feel just completely down and unable to press on. They might have a fear of people. They might not be able to talk. They need more courage, faith, boldness, and confidence. And, and Jesus offers this. And as you can see, the answers to all these things are in the Bible. This is what Jesus says, Matthew 10, I'm sorry, Matthew 5, 10, and 12. This is an encouragement to remember, to help them with. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And let's just stop there for a minute. There's a whole bunch of bad things that are going to happen to every Christian in this room that you might not recognize, but they have to do with persecution. They have to do with you proclaiming to your family that you're a Christian, you want to do things God's way. And and there's a lot of stuff that comes your way in the name of persecution that you don't even know is coming from persecution because you're standing firm in the Lord and this, and Satan hates that. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. You, you may be going through a hard time because of that. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> he said blessed. Wow. Oh, here he says it again. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. See, you, you might not even know it's, that all this is happening because you're a Christian. Like, how did I don't do, I'm not a troublemaker. Why is this coming my way? Rejoice and be glad for your reward is in heaven. Is, your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Just Just cheer up. If you're walking with the Lord and you're getting attacked, and where do the attacks come from? Usually the closest ones to you. Recognize, okay, I'm trying to walk with the Lord. I'm trying to be an example to these people. And what have they done? They're biting me. And they've turned on me. These are something, things to think about, to encourage one another. John 15, 18, Jesus says this. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me first before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. The world hates Christians. They need to be encouraged with reminders of God's promises and provision for them. The the promises and provision. You already need to remember the provision. What has God gotten you through already? And Jesus says this, John 10, 27. My Father, who has given them to me, Jesus is saying this about his sheep. My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. You might think, I am off over here. Satan's beating me up. I'm disconnected from God. He doesn't care about me. I'm way over here, and Satan has snatched me away. No, 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 no. Or I've wandered off. No, you can't wander off. No one, a sheep, cannot wander off from God's hand. And this is 
encouragement. First John 5, 1 John 5.1, John reminds us why he wrote all these things about Jesus. He wrote all these things about what Jesus said and Jesus did. And this is why. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. The Bible is written so that when you leave here today, you can know if, you're, if you've surrendered to Christ that you're a Christian. You can know that if you get hit by a train right outside the door here, that you are going to heaven. Do people need to hear that? Do our brothers and sisters need to be reminded of that? Yes. And with this, as Paul has done, they need to be reminded to put on, I saw this a couple weeks ago, put on as a helmet the hope of salvation. The unruly ones need to gird their loins and, hey, you need to get squared away and get ready for battle because what's happening is, is that while we're dragging you into battle and you're all a soup sandwich and you're falling apart, you're, just stay home. Okay, but, but now we see that we need to remind those that are faint-hearted to put on the armor of God, remember the armor of God, Re remember in this case the helmet of the hope of salvation means. It's not put on the helmet to be saved today. It's remind yourself to put on the helmet that reminds you constantly that you are already are saved and that you have the hope of salvation and put that on. And so that's the encouragement we need to help other, other people. Hey, you need to put your helmet on today. You're, 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 you're very faint-hearted, and you need to recognize that you are saved, and you cannot lose your salvation. So God has not abandoned you. Re be reminded every day that they cannot lose their salvation, Romans 8, 29 to 30. And with this, they already have victory in Christ, and they need to be reminded that they know the end of the story that we win. They need to be reminded of these things. With this, the greatest encouragement to the faint-hearted is the truth of the Bible. It's got all the answers. Admonish the unruly, yet encourage the faint-hearted. The third one here then is help the weak. Verse 14 still, in section C it would be, help the weak. And it means, help means to have a strong attachment to someone to cling to them, to hold fast to them, to be devoted to them. Proverbs 4, 6, it's, it, we see it in Matthew 6, 24, Luke 16, all through. It's an imperative command to help the weak. Grab onto them and help them as they're stumbling and move them along in the skirmish line as you're pressing on in the battle. And God is saying, now we're going to do this and you're going to stand firm here and, and somebody's fallen, somebody grab them. That's what we need to do. Cling to, hold fast to, and be devoted to the weak. The weak are those with the incapacity or limitation to be strong. They just, it might be temporary or it might be something that, uh, that, that they've gone through their whole life. And because this is mankind's natural default, we're all spiritually weak. Everybody is. And with this, they might be a little weak. They might be having a weak moment or just being an overall weak Christian. But what this means is that they're weak in the sense of the flesh. They're, they give in to, they easily give in to compromise or temptation. That's the weakness that we're talking about here. They get duped. They get tempted. And you're, you're saying, come on, man, you're holding them up. You're, you're stumbling again. That's what we're talking about. Christ warned the sleepy disciples on the night of his arrest. He warned them this. And this it was a warning, but it's also an encouragement. Keep watching and praying, because they were sleepy. He's saying, pray with me. Stay, stay awake. And he says, keep watching and praying so that you may not enter, enter, enter into temptation. And then he, so he's warning them about this. And then he's also advising them of this and advising us of our truth. The truth is, is as Christians, our spirit is willing to be strong. But our flesh is naturally weak, and God understands that. So everybody in this room is going to have a weak moment. That's for sure. That's what we're talking about here. The spirit is willing, but I just can't pull myself together today. Well, that's when we come alongside here. We'll hold you up. This is all through the Bible. Matthew 26, 41 is the verse that I just read. 
They are unable to carry their own burdens, maybe carrying more than they should. We've heard this, that God's going to give you the strength to carry, to deal with the things that come along. And sometimes it's a matter of recognizing, you know, you put all this on your plate and now you're, tra- you're, you're collapsed. There's things on their plate that shouldn't be there that you may have put on. You need to, we need to help them. This doesn't go on your plate. This is, this is what God's going to do or not do. This is what this person's responsibility is. Don't, don't take that on your plate and be overwhelmed. That's not supposed to be for you. Now, these things are on your plate, and we want to help you carry those things. But I'm, I'm here to tell you that that's not for you to worry about. That's not for you to do. And with this, it could have been a lifelong thing uh, before they became Christians. They could have been victims of legalism, as Jesus had accused the Jewish leaders of doing. And, and I'll untangle this for you. He says this in Luke eleven forty six: 46. Woe to you lawyers as well. I'm speaking to the Jewish leaders. For you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear, while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. They might have been in this whole legalistic thing where like, I just can't, I can't stand up. Don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this, don't do that. All these extra rules, and they're just exhausted, and they're completely collapsed. Why? Because they weren't things that God put on their plate. It's what the legalists put on their plate. With this, then, they might be overwhelmed with the burden of religion that they just came out of or that they grew up in. And now... And now what could happen to them is now they want freedom because I'm sick of all those things. And now they're swinging the other way. And now what they do is they want this freedom, even if it's sinful freedom, because the load was too heavy and they throw everything off. And there's things that they shouldn't have thrown off their plate. And with this, they may be the ones that become unruly themselves because I'm sick and tired of this, and I'm sick and tired of that, and nobody's going to tell me what to do. And now all of a sudden, that's the person that's unruly that used to follow all the rules because they don't recognize what they're supposed to hang on to and what they're not, and we need to make sure we help each other with these things. On the other hand, are those coming, possibly coming from a life, a previous life of liberalism, which means they felt like they can do whatever they wanted, and nobody was going to tell them what to do, and now... Became, becoming Christians, now they actually could, uh, they have a weak conscience because of what they used to do, and now they could become legalists. I used to do this, so I'm not going anywhere near that, 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 or that. And with this, they're afraid of Christian liberty. 1 Corinthians 10 talks about this. They're afraid to do anything enjoyable or fun. Because they used to do all that stuff, and now they won't have joy. They refuse to have joy in the Christian life because uh, they're not supposed to have fun. And so they could be weak Christians that way. Paul teaches then with this, and he hits it in many passages. Uh, Romans 14, the whole chapter is dedicated to it, all the way into chapter 15. And also 1 Corinthians 2 chapters, 1 through 8. It's that the strong Christians are to help the weak Christians with these things. Help them get through. Because the weak Christians, in various ways, in this sense, have a weak conscience, and they're afraid to do anything. And how do you help them with teaching them what they can do what they can't do? By by teaching them what the Bible says. Here, here, sit down. Sit down. We're going to look at what this says. You're struggling with this here. We're going to find the answer. The Bible has the answers. So regardless of their background, the weak need strong support from others. Galatians 6, 2 says, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. You want to help each other with their burdens. It might mean that you actually pick some of them up. It might mean that you say, that one, take it over there to the trash and dump it in there. That's how I'm going to help you. I don't really need to touch it either. You, You just need to go put that in the trash. Don't carry that anymore. That's what we're supposed to be doing in the church. In all of this, their faith is is weak. And with this, all people are naturally spiritually weak without the Holy Spirit. 
And we saw that even Christians could have times in their life that they might be spiritually weak. The Bible gives you examples of godly people experiencing, and you need, to, you need to know these things and encourage others with these things. The Bible gives examples of godly people as experiencing both spiritual weakness and strength throughout their lives. And we see with Abraham, and I'll give you an example with him. We know that at one moment he was really weak, and he, uh, he told his wife, hey, hey, when you're going through town there, I'm just telling you that you're my sister because if, if they find out that, that we're married, then they're going to try to kill me to get you. And, and, he, and he did it twice. <laughs> he was totally weak. But here we see another example uh, that Romans 4, 9, 19 gives us the way that he describes it. He, can, he kind of compresses it. Speaking of Abraham, who has promised a son, yet still didn't receive one yet. <laughs> Without becoming weak in faith, Think about this for a minute. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body. Okay. Okay. He looked in the mirror, and he looked at the calendar, and he contemplated his own body as being now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. And, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he, he looked at all this with respect to the promise of God, though, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. So Christians and people of God will go up and down. And these are passages from, hey, Abraham messed up in this, but look, he, he came around and not to mention Abraham is known in Hebrews chapter 11 as being one of the most faithful men that ever lived. Abraham saw his fleshly weaknesses, yet trusted in God and grew strong in the faith. We need to encourage each other with these things. And with this, the weak can be confident in their prayers, as weak as they may seem, because they have the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.26 says this, The Spirit helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray, as we should. Sometimes you're so weak, you don't even know what to say. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And regardless of what all the charismatics say that this means, what it means is, is when you're going to the Lord and you're just saying, help, the Spirit articulates what you need to the Father. So just like Peter did when he was sinking in the water, he says, help me, Lord. He didn't, he didn't get into this articulation. See, what's happening is there's, there's big waves, and I'm like really not able to swim. Really. No, no, help. And <laughs> And we can encourage them when they're by themselves. I don't even know how to pray. I'll just say help. And I'll, and I'll say it with you. And with this, though, for the Christian, we know this. Paul is talking about this episode that he went through. Paul reminds us of, his, of this reality of our spiritual strengths and weaknesses. This is what he says, 2 Corinthians 12. You're not in this alone. We're, all these great guys in the Bible go through these things. Paul says, therefore, I am well content with weaknesses. He's like, I know that's going to happen with insults, with distresses, and with persecutions and with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, if you think you're all that and you're strong, you're really weak. But when you're weak and you go to the Lord, you're strong. That's the way it works. Encourage one another with these things. This is 2 Corinthians 12.10. For the Christian, then, spiritual strength will prevail in the end. And with this, since the natural man is already weak, the weak sheep needed, need to be helped by the strong sheep, even teaching them the discipline to press on. Like, <laughs> you need to pray more. You need to be in a Bible study, and you need to read the Bible yourself. You need to do these things. And Here, you, here I'm going to call you, and you need to come. Or I'm going to call you and read this to you. I'm gonna, you. You have to help discipline these people. That's what's going to happen. And some of us in this room had people do that for us. And so we see this as God commanded and yet comforted. Joshua says this, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. He's saying, be strong and courageous. It's a command. But then God says this, Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So, so it, it comes down to this, that God, when God commands you to do something, He's going to help you to do it. Therefore, the strong sheep are able to help the weak sheep with the biblical truths that, these are biblical truths, just overall. Everyone is born with a tendency to be spiritually weak. Everyone has a background that contributes to their weakness one way or another. 
Every Christian will experience spiritual weakness from time to time. And God commands Christians to be spiritually strong and therefore supplies his Holy Spirit, his word, and either and even other Christians to help this to happen. There is hope for those that are spiritually weak. So admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and here we go. Verse 14. Bear the unbearable. Okay. We talked about people um, that had some problems. We also had, uh, had a, a glimpse of, of a pro of problem people. But right now, we see bear the unbearable. Be patient with everyone. The word patient means to bear up under provocation without complaint. It means forbearing, long-suffering, slow to anger. Proverbs 19.11 says, A man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. His, his discretion makes him slow to anger. He recognizes, uh, like, ah, i got to be patient here. i got to slow down. I can see what's going on here. And it is his glory then to overlook a transgression, meaning I'm not going to let this get to me. That's being patient. 1 Corinthians 13.4, we just read, love is patient. Galatians 5.22, patience is the fruit of the Spirit. And thankfully, God is patient with us. 2, Corinthians, or 2 Peter 3.9, it says, The Lord is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. See, the Lord is patient with, with the greatest of knuckleheads. And I'm just hitting that lightly because this goes way beyond the term knuckleheads. It's an imperative command. With this, it can be very tempting for the strong to get impatient with the unruly, faint-hearted, and weak. But we are commanded, and in this passage, to deal with them. And it's hard enough, let's admit it, guys, it's hard enough to deal with the hurting ones, but almost unbearable to deal with another group. It's hard enough to bear someone's burdens and that's it, it, hurting and thinking, I can't even help them. I don't even know what to do. This is killing me. I'd rather not be here because it's tearing me up that I can't even help. And this person is miserable. It's hard enough in that situation to where you just want to run away. But here, it's almost unbearable to deal with another group. And these are those that are known as basically the exhausting ones. They have constant needs and constant issues. They're the special sheep who constantly need more attention than the others do. We are to exercise patience with even them. Jesus did this with his disciples, even after showing just like God did with the Israelites and parting the Red Sea in front of them, and they still didn't get it. Jesus showed this great power to his disciples over and over again. And finally, even in Matthew 8, 26 and 16, 8, he says, why are you afraid, you men of little faith? I mean, he could have just gone on. I'm done with you people. You people are a pain. You are the problem, the special sheep. I'm going to go over there and get the mature sheep. And of course, of course, how about this guy? You guys know who I'm talking about, the special guy. The one that's constantly saying stupid things, foolish things. His name is Peter. For example, when Jesus spoke about the Father's predetermined plan for him to go to the cross, what did Peter say? God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. He just told him it's the plan. And he starts just popping off with this stuff. Matthew 16, 22. Then on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Peter starts babbling about building tents, up there, and the father finally had to say, hey, 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 listen to my son. This was in Matthew 17, 4. And then G, uh, Peter says this, Matthew 26, 33. Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. I mean, this guy, can you imagine? And these are just things that are reported in Scripture. Jesus was hanging out with this guy all the time. He says this, Matthew 26, 35. Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Then, after admitting to Jesus that he knew that he was the Son of God, basically God himself, uh, Jesus wanted to wash his feet, and he tries to tell Jesus to boss Jesus around, saying, never shall you wash my feet. This is, this is Peter. 
is, is Peter uh, famous now? Yeah, he's very famous. But this is Peter. Then, a short time later, denying Christ when it got scary. We know that. He was confronted with, oh, you were hanging out with Jesus? And he says, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. And then, he says on two different occasions, including to a little girl, I do not know the man. This Peter guy was a special sheep that required special patience. Just in the examples that were recorded in the Bible, and I have nine of them here. Keep this in mind. We're using number nine. Just in these examples that were recorded in the Bible, we see how Peter stupidly and even sinfully spoke on nine occasions. This is just in the scripture. This same Peter then asks this question that really shows what kind of guy he is. He says this, Matthew 18, 21, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? <laughs> he, he said all these bonehead and sinful things at least nine times, and he's asking Jesus, hey, can we just like only forgive him seven times? This is, this is Peter. And fortunately for Peter and for us and for those that we are supposed to be patient with, Jesus gave this answer. Matthew 18, 22. I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Peter's blessed that he made it, he, that he upped it from seven because Peter would have been slammed. But basically, Peter would have been in hell for the stuff that he said. I mean, we, we know that. Why? Because he did survive denying Christ. So, basically, this is how often we shall be patient and forgive a constant yet repented, repentive pain in the neck. There's going to be sheep like that, and we are supposed to be patient with them. And as you know, Peter repented. Peter wept bitterly. Peter was restored. And it's even in the scripture, he even stumbled again with his mouth, even after this, yet became a bold apostle. Because Christ was patient with him. And it's throughout Scripture. And therefore, he is in, it, this is an example to all of us to bear the unbearable. So admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and bear the unbearable. And then, verse 5, address the evil. Address the evil. Well, you're going to say, Dave, I don't see it in there. Well, it is in there. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always see that which see after that, I'm sorry, seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Do not repay evil with evil, but do what's good regarding evil for the good of them and for all people. Okay. How do you deal with evil in a way that is good for everybody? And this, in this case, has to do with someone in the church who has done or is doing something evil. It's an imperative command not to repay them or recompense or pay back evil for evil, but instead to seek what is good. Okay, well, the world tells us the Christian thing to do. You guys know that. We talk about that almost every week. The world has all these great ideas of what the Christian thing to do is. And usually what that means is just sweep it under the rug. We know that. But this is what the Lord says about this. He says, vengeance is mine. He says that he will repay all through the Bible. Matthew 16, 27, Romans 12, 17, 1 Peter 2, 19, Revelation 18. It's all through the Bible. He will repay even the persecutors against us. He will repay. It's not right what that person did to me. They tore my whole heart out. God will repay. We do not seek vengeance. And it says here in Proverbs 17, 13, if you take vengeance, be warned. He who returns evil for good, evil will not depart from his house. Like you want to play the evil game? You want to do it? You want to play that way? then you're going to be in that evil game and, and you are going to live in that game your whole life of, of playing this ping pong game of throwing evil back and forth. But instead, verse 15, always seek after that which is good for 
one another and for all people. Seek means to haste, run, or pursue. And it's also an imperative command to pursue that which is good for one another and for all people. And the question is, how can dealing with sin be good for everyone all at the same time? It just sounds like if you're dealing with sin, it's going to be bad for somebody if you're really dealing with sin. How does this work out? How could this work out for the best of both the good and the evil people? How can dealing with sin the right way, the Bible gives us the instructions on how to deal with both the good and evil, both inside the church and outside the church for everyone's good? That just doesn't seem mathematically possible. How can we deal with evil and it be good for them? Christians are not Christians. First, as our context dictates, basically, we're, we're mostly talking about how to deal with evil inside the church for the good of everyone, yet for the good of everyone even outside the church. So Jesus gives us four stages of what's called church discipline and dealing with sin in the church, Matthew 18, 15 through 20. He gives us these steps, these stages. These are commanded by him in his church. He calls the shots. The first step is one sheep speak privately to another. Basically, it comes to this, admonishing the unruly. It's like, hey, you're doing this. So just one sheep who notices it. Hey, you know, you're, you're, you're unruly, and it, you're basically this close, and maybe you've even crossed the line, and you need to knock it off. If he doesn't repent and it keeps going on, Jesus says, then bring two or three more with you and say, hey, man, everybody knows what's going on and you got to knock it off. Thirdly, if he doesn't repent, tell it to the church. And if not, that means tell it to the church. Who wants to be the guy up here pointing somebody out in front of everybody? None of us want to be that guy. But this is what Jesus commands. If he still doesn't repent, can you imagine somebody that's sitting in church and it gets pointed out to them and they still won't repent? Well, we can see what kind of heart they have. Jesus says, Jesus says, Jesus says this, treat him as an outsider and remove him from the church. Matthew 18, 15 to 20, because he's acting like an outsider. He's not acting like a Christian. Hebrews 10. Let me just tell you this. It's not because you've determined he's not a Christian. It's you can rightly determine and judge that person is not acting like a Christian. And you have the ability and the right and the command to actually judge somebody who says there's a Christian. Uh, I don't think so. They're not acting like it. I, it's up between them and God. But right now, they're not acting like a Christian. With this, though, Hebrews 12, 1 through 12, shows us how this process is good for the sinning Christian who really is a Christian, as discipline, this is what it talks about, discipline is administered through pain from our loving Father. Discipline is done and accomplished through pain. When it gets to that point, there must be pain from our loving Heavenly Father, and pain brings His people back to Him. That's why in the Bible we're commanded to discipline our children. And it escalates, and it can be painful. This is what Jesus tells us. 1 Corinthians 5 shows how this is good for the people in the church and how it's good for the person that has now been sent out of the church. Wait a minute. How, how can it be good for everyone? Well, Paul describes it. First, it's good for the purity and protection of the church if an unrepentant person is forced to leave instead of staying, victimizing and contaminating other Christians. It's good for the church, 1 Corinthians 5.13. And this is the crazy part. How is it good for the person? It is good for the person to be out of the false sense of security, sitting in church thinking that they're okay, and in reality heading for hell because nobody has pointed it out to them. It gives them the opportunity to not sit in church for 30 years thinking they're okay, and then finding out when they get up and meet Jesus in Matthew 5, 7, 23, and Jesus says, I don't, I don't know you, depart from me. 
It's a matter of, hey, we're giving you a wake-up call, and it does hurt. It does hurt. It gives him time to reflect on his salvation. He's not all snuggly-wuggly with everybody, getting all the nice stuff. Paul says this about one such person. He says this in 1 Corinthians 5, 9. I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, so his flesh may be trashed, that Satan is going to tear this guy up with the hope that he gets broken down and says, okay, and submits and that he might be saved. Ouch. We don't want to watch it. We have family members that way, but this is the way that the Bible describes dealing with evil in our church. And the truth is evil in our home. And it's the best thing for them to be put in a position of ouch instead of you giving them foot rubs all the time and thinking that they're okay. It's better for them. It's better for the church. And with this, the writer of Hebrews and Paul and Jesus, they all say that we are to address evil in the church and that it's good for everyone to address it. With this, the stubborn may still respond to the gospel as long as they're still breathing. This is God's grace. He is patient. But we cannot candy coat it and help somebody think that they're doing just fine. And as soon as they walk away, we're like, yeah, that guy's going straight to hell. We can't do that. Therefore, dealing with evil is not to be for personal gratification in seeing somebody get what they deserve but instead offering them the goodness of the gospel through repentance, while at the same time protecting the sheep and their purity along with Christ's name in the church. That's a Christian church? That has the name Christ? And look what's going on there. No, no. We need to protect the people. We need to protect the purity. We need to protect Christ's reputation. So with this, in this passage, we see that this passage, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 and 15, gives five commands that show your responsibilities towards other Christians so that you may live in peace with one another through loving one another. So we saw this. Admonish the unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Bear the unbearable. Address sin. This has been said in the ministry, and I'm pretty sure that even if you've never heard it before, you can totally relate. The ministry would be great without all the people. Pastors have said it for years. The ministry would be, it would just be wonderful if it wasn't for the people. Well, that's what it is. But this is life in the true church, and the Bible gives us the answers we need, even if it forces us to step it up a notch. It's hard being a Christian, but we have all the answers, and we who happen to be strong today, because of the grace of God, knowing that we could be weak tomorrow, it's our day to encourage the faint-hearted and help the weak. We need to be in that situation where we do this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.